All right, we're back. How's it going, everyone? Time for some more computer vision. Uh, so for logistical stuff, homework four is out right now. It is due tonight, but everyone has three more late days to work on it because it was out so late. Uh, if you have issues, we have a couple office hours today, and you can always get us online. So we also have final project proposals that we want you guys to do. So these should be pretty short, just like one to two paragraphs. Uh, there is an open assignment for it on Canvas right now, I think. And if there's not, there will be very soon. But I think it's already on. I think Kiana put it on. And so on Canvas, I think you can sort of form groups if you want to. So if you're doing the final project in a group, you don't each have to submit a proposal. Just form the group on Canvas, if that is possible, and submit the uh, project proposal as a group. We're going to have it due next Tuesday. Uh, you know, this, is, this should be pretty short. Hopefully, you guys have been sort of thinking of ideas during the quarter. So just write down like a paragraph or two about what you want to do. It should be uh, about as much work as like two homeworks is because you guys only have a couple weeks to work on it. The actual stuff that you guys will be presenting to us is basically just we're going to have a poster session. So there will be a poster session on exam week during your regularly scheduled exam time. And we'll go around and look at all the posters and talk to you guys about the stuff that you guys did. And then you'll just turn in the PDF or whatever of your poster on Canvas. So there won't be any kind of final report or anything. Uh, most of the grading will just be at the poster session and then just kind of looking at your poster afterward. Uh, but for right now, just you know, figure out what you want to do over the weekend, jot down something pretty quick, and send it to us. We just want to make sure that everyone has uh, some idea for what they're going to be working on. We're going to have sort of a default project if people don't want to basically come up with their own thing. And it will just be training an image classifier on some new data set. And we will basically have a little educational competition on Kaggle. So you can do just competitions that are limited basically just to you guys. So you'll be able to submit basically predictions on some new data set. Uh, this will be a challenging data set. It'll probably be fairly large. Um, and you guys will have to kind of take the data and process it yourself and figure out how to train. We won't give you any sort of sample starter code or anything like that. So you'll have to basically do it all from scratch if, if you decide to just kind of do the default project. Otherwise, if you want to do something else, you can just kind of come up with whatever you want and uh, let us know. And I assume that you know, most of the projects will be like, this is fine. And if there is any issues, uh, this will help us catch it early on. And then we'll just be like, oh, maybe you, know, you can do something a little bit different like this instead, or help you kind of work out what would be a good project. Any questions about logistics or final project proposals or anything? Yes? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, so the default project is going to be uh, either, it's, it's probably going to be classifying different images of different birds. So given an image of a bird, what kind of a bird is it? Um, there is a data set that I want to use for this that I'm just not sure if I can yet, because at the moment, it's basically for academic use. Uh, I think I can sort of figure out ways around this, basically. But um, or like we're not supposed to basically redistribute it. So we might have you guys, and I guess that would be sort of part of the assignment, would be going to this website, signing up for an account, uh, telling them that you're doing research and then getting access to the data. But I have to make sure that that would work out um, according to sort of Kaggle's rules for these kinds of things too. Um, but it's, yeah, so, so I'll post that probably tonight, uh, what the default project sort of is. Any other questions about random things? Yeah. You can use what I, it's, uh, there we go. So I mean, you don't even have to do neural network stuff. If you are really interested in stereo vision, we didn't have a stereo homework. You could go, you know, implement a multi-view stereo algorithm. You could go implement uh, shape from motion or something like that, and that could be like a really cool final project. Uh, so anything sort of along those lines is is good. Yeah. Yeah, so homework four is due tonight, but we are just giving everyone three additional late days. So uh, instead of making it due any later, we would like for people to turn it in basically sooner rather than later. Um, but instead of basically making it due later, we're just going to give people more late days so they can use the late days now if you want. Uh, 
So effectively, it, you know, it could be due in three days for you if you wanted it to, even if you've already used all your late days for other stuff, yeah. Is there one more? There's one more homework, yeah. And, and that homework, Kiana is working on it right now. I think it will be out uh, tonight or tomorrow. And she is more responsible than me, so it will actually be out today or tomorrow. Also, another thing I forgot to mention on here, but there is going to be a PyTorch uh, tutorial that I posted about both, I sent you guys an email about it and posted about it in the, uh, in the Google group thing. But she is going to give basically a two hour tutorial on PyTorch. A lot of it will be just on installing it, setting it up, what kinds of things you can do with it, and then doing some basic stuff with PyTorch. So that would be really cool to go to if you guys are interested. Uh, you're going to be using PyTorch for the next homework. And it would probably be a really good sort of head start on doing that homework. So that will be tomorrow. I think it's, it's in the channel, but I think it's 12 to 2. And it's in the nanotechnology building. I think it's NAN181. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Group size should be less than or equal to five unless you have some weird thing that you want to do that requires a bunch of people and you email us and we tell you that it's okay, basically. Uh, I imagine that most people will be in groups of around two to three or by themselves, uh, but if people want bigger groups, they can do it. Uh, we sort of, you know, would expect some kind of, probably not linear, but like close to linear scaling of project complexity depending on number of people. Anyone else? Cool. All right. So homework four, homework five is out soon, final projects, PyTorch tutorial. Uh, that, that room can fit a bunch of people, I think. So if you guys have friends or something who are interested in the PyTorch tutorial too, they could you know, come along and hang out um, if, if people want to learn stuff. So. Yeah. Let's talk about what we talked about last time. So we had this issue where when we're processing images and we basically uh, want to run a neural network on images, we're going to have a bunch of weights. Uh, and this is because images are really big. If you think of like a 256 by 256 by 3 image, it has like 100,000 pixels-ish, I think. I don't know. Someone can do that. It's a lot. Uh, and then when you start sort of connecting, you know, those kinds of images together with neural networks, if you have 100,000 things in your input and 100,000 things in your output, you're, you're going to need 100,000 times 100,000 weights to connect those two layers if you're just sort of using a normal densely connected network. And that's a lot to process. So instead of basically using these dense connections, we're going to take advantage of this structure that we know about in our images where nearby pixels are related to each other, far apart pixels are not related to each other, and we can take that into account when we're building this statistical model. So what we're going to do instead of this you know, dense network where we take every output pixel is just a weighted sum of all of the input, we're going to use convolutions where every pixel is going to be a weighted sum of some of the input. And, uh, we're also, so, you know, we have sort of this sparsity that this imposes where we're only looking at a subset of the input image when we're determining an output pixel. We also have this weight sharing that happens because when we're applying a convolution, we use the same weights to apply that convolution at all of the parts in the image. And this sort of makes sense. If you're looking for an edge in an image, it doesn't really matter where that edge is in the image. You can always use the same weights or the same convolutional filter to find that edge. So it actually makes sense that we might not really want to use different weights for different parts of the images, especially when we're just looking for sort of these basic uh, features if, if we're looking for things like edges or uh, blobs or stuff like that. So we introduced uh, convolutional neural networks, and they're made up of a few different new kinds of layers. So a convolutional layer will take in as input an image and run a bunch of convolutional filters on that image. It will output an image, which will be sort of a feature map or some kind of processing applied to the original image. And oftentimes what you end up uh, doing is basically your spatial dimensions for your input and output are going to be about the same, 
and you're just going to change the number of channels in your output feature map. So the number of channels will basically be the number of filters, and each channel will be the response of a particular filter when you run it over the input. And so we still have, you know, like our original neural network, the output is just a weighted sum with respect to the input, and usually we apply some activation function on top of that. We're just doing a little bit different weighted sum, where instead of looking at the whole input image, we're looking at uh, just these sparse connections from locally sort of this neighborhood of pixels. We talked about the kinds of parameters that go into a convolutional layer, so things like kernel size can make a big difference. So typically people use uh, convolutional filters or kernels that are you know, one to one to about 11 by 11. And if you think about it, you know, 11 by 11 would be processing a pretty large uh, region of the input image. A one by one filter is basically doing no spatial processing. It's only doing a combination over channels in the input image. So, you know, a three by three image, usually, or a three by three filter will do some kind of spatial processing and then also look at differences between the different channels in the input image. A one by one filter doesn't have the spatial information. It's just sort of doing this linear combination of channels along the same uh, pixel location or spatial location in the input. And filters usually have the same number of channels as the input image. There are some caveats to this later on that we're going to talk about with grouped convolutions, but just for a normal convolutional layer, your filter will be processing over all of the channels in the input image. So a single pixel in one uh, channel of your output image is going to be a linear combination over some spatial dimension and over all of the channels of the input image or feature map. We also talked about padding, which is just sort of how convolutions handle basically the edge case. You guys did padding sort of implicitly in your homework by using the getPixel function when you're doing convolutions. This is something that you can sort of decide what you want to do while you're implementing these neural networks. Sometimes it makes sense to basically only look at pixels that are in bounds, basically. And if you don't have any padding, you end up basically making your output image a little bit smaller every time, depending on how big this filter is. So if the filter is three by three, you're going to end up cutting off basically one pixel on either side of your output image. If it's five by five, you'll end up cutting off two pixels on either side of your output image, et cetera. Uh, so if you do nothing, you're basically going to make your output a little bit smaller. If you add padding, then you're going to maintain the size of your output image or potentially even make it a little bit larger. We also talked about striding, which is how far you move the filter between applications of it to the input image. Typically, people use stride of one convolutions for most of the processing, and then sometimes we'll do downsampling using convolutions by using a convolution of stride two or potentially larger. And so if you, you know, use a convolution of stride one, you're going to get an output image that is about the same dimensions as your input. And if you use a convolution of stride two, you're going to get an output that's about uh, two times downsampled or half the size of your input image. We also talked about basically how we do these operations using matrices because we really like matrices. And so the first step is basically running this m to call function where we're going to just extract these spatial regions from the input where we would have applied the feature and stack them into these columns of this matrix. And m to call can do a bunch of things. It can handle uh, different kernel sizes. It can handle the striding and padding and things like that. And then we can just multiply this new representation by our filters to get the output. So we have our filters in a certain matrix representation, and we have sort of transformed the image a little bit to fit into this matrix. And then when we just do the matrix multiplication of the filters by uh, our new representation of our image, we get the actual output that we sort of want from running this convolution. And this is also nice because we can basically uh, do both of the backward steps that we want to do too. So we can figure out the change of the filters by multiplying our error by the transpose of our m to call input. And we can figure out uh, what the previous layer's delta should be from our current layer's delta uh, by multiplying basically the filters by 
the error that our current layer makes, and then running this inverse m to call function to sum together the error that comes from different locations in the image. So remember that we have this weight sharing thing that happens. So the error that a filter makes comes from a bunch of different places in the image because we apply that filter to a bunch of different locations in the image. But we're sharing those weights across applications. So when we're trying to figure out how much we want to update the weights by, we have to figure out both the error that that filter made on the first application, but also on the second application, the third, the fourth, et cetera. And we're going to sum all of those errors together. And that will be sort of the amount that we want to adjust the weight uh, for that convolution by. We also talked about pooling layers, which are another way to basically shrink down uh, or do some downsampling on an image. And kind of the idea behind pooling layers is you know, we have run some convolutional layers over an image, and maybe we've extracted things like edges. And at this point, we don't necessarily need all of the spatial information. For example, if you know there's a horizontal edge at one pixel, you can be pretty sure that if you move to the left or to the right, there will also be a horizontal edge at those pixels. That's sort of the point of what edges are. So we can start doing some downsampling. There are a few different kinds of downsampling that people do. They do average pooling, median pooling, max pooling, min pooling. Uh, typically, the, you're going to see basically uh, max pooling a lot in the intermediate layers of a network. And this kind of makes sense from a feature processing standpoint. If you run some, uh, some filters over an image, you basically want to look for really strong responses to those filters. And what max pooling does is just amplify whatever the strongest response in a region was to a particular filter. You also see average pooling a lot at the end of networks. What average pooling does is sort of aggregate together a bunch of your filter information, and then you can use that uh, and sort of the last step to either have some fully connected network that does your final predictions, uh, or some fully connected layer that does your final predictions, or you can have the average pooling actually do sort of the final predictions themselves. Uh, and, and we'll look at that a little bit in a second. We also have basically, uh, like our convolution, we have this stride parameter that controls how much we're doing the downsampling by. So people do run pooling layers with a stride of one. This won't downsample the image at all. It'll basically just amplify the maximum uh, responses to certain filters within a given region. But generally, people are using strides larger than one. Uh, two, again, is the most common stride that you'll see uh, just to downsample the image by a factor of two. We also have just sort of the local region uh, as a hyperparameter that you might want to pass in. Usually you don't want a really large region. Usually you want something around the same size as the stride of the max pooling that you're doing. So typically you will see either two by two or three by three regions for how big you're going to look in for the max pooling. And typically you'll see a stride of two. Uh, although those can kind of, yeah. Yep, so you're going to look in a region, and you're just going to pick out whatever the maximum value is, and that's the output for that pooling operation at that location. Uh, I think people have experimented with that a little bit as well. So one thing to think about is a lot of, especially max pooling, um, was developed... Well, I guess not really. I think people were doing max pooling with logistic activations as well. But just kind of the mindset I think that computer vision people are typically in is like you run a filter over the image and strong, like high responses to that filter indicate like that that feature is present and low responses indicate that that feature isn't present. So you could imagine doing like an absolute value and then doing the max of that or something. Uh, in general, recently people have been using um, like ReLU activation functions. And in that case, your uh, output is either going to be zero or some positive number. So if you were doing some like, you know, extrema, it might often be like zero or something. You know, like there would be weird things that happen. And sort of you only have this positive uh, range. So max pooling in that case kind of makes sense. But yeah, you could imagine basically doing. Uh, instead of max pooling something more complex to look for extreme predictions. And that would make more sense if you're doing like derivatives or something. 
Um, but yeah, people generally think about Mac only. Yeah, it could potentially, and we're going to talk about that as well in a second. Um, yeah, it's a big problem. Any other questions? Cool. So we, uh, the last sort of layer that we talked about was just kind of the normal neural network layer that we normally think about, these fully connected layers where all of the input is going to be connected to all of the output. And oftentimes these are used at sort of the very end of our network to do our final prediction. So the convolutional layers, maybe we'll produce some kind of feature map like we talked about before. Uh, so instead of hog features or SIFT features, we can imagine our convolutional network is outputting a feature map that is actually specifically you know, tailored to the task that we're trying to do. And then our final output will be some fully connected layer that is doing some you know, linear classification or something like that. So you can think about this as basically just like pasting on sort of like a softmax regression or logistic regression or a linear classifier or a linear model to the end of some big feature extractor, basically. And fully connected layers, obviously, you have all of the input connected to all of the output. So the output doesn't really have any spatial information anymore. There's nothing constraining the output to kind of depend on spatial information from the input. So you're not going to get sort of a feature map or like an image that you got from the convolutional layers. You're just going to get some vector. And that vector has lost all sort of spatial consistency. So nearby pixels in that vector or nearby values in that vector aren't necessarily related to each other. So these are all sort of the convolutional building blocks uh, or sort of the core convolutional building blocks in these neural networks. And uh, this is where we ended last time. And basically, just using these building blocks, you can get really far in terms of uh, building really powerful computer vision models. But we're not done yet, because people are always you know, thinking about new ways to rearrange these things and new layers to put in and stuff. So today, we're going to talk about different network architectures and sort of how we're going to use these building blocks to solve uh, some core problems in vision. So we've talked about before this MNIST data set, and you guys are playing with it right now, so you're probably pretty familiar with it. Uh, this is actually, my slide is just wrong. It's 60,000 images of handwriting, uh, 10,000. So it's, it's 60,000 training images and 10,000 test images, I think. Uh, they're 28 by 28. They're grayscale images. And they're the numbers 0 <laughs> through 9. So it's this 10 class classification problem. and. You know, you can imagine basically we want to take in one of these images and predict what the output of this image is. And we played around already with basically doing this um, with logistic regression. And you guys are trying out basically using neural networks in your homework, but fully connected neural networks. So LeNet uh, by this guy, Jan LeCun, was sort of the first modern convolutional neural network in kind of the ways that we think about it. Obviously, in research, everyone is kind of building on top of the ideas of past people. So there are a lot of ideas in this that are shared with other people uh, and other work from earlier back. But this is kind of what computer vision researchers recognize. Or you know, if, if a person had never heard of any of sort of the history of computer vision research, but just kind of knew what people were currently using, they would look at this and they would totally recognize it as like a modern convolutional network. So LeNet uh, is notable because it got super high accuracy on MNIST, 99% uh, accuracy. And it has all of these elements that we kind of think of. So it has these different layers, these convolutional layers, max pooling and fully connected layers. It has these activation functions. It uses logistic activation. Uh, and it uses it after these pooling layers. So instead of doing the activation before it does max pooling, it does it afterward. Uh, but, uh, and nowadays we might use you know, ReLU activations, but it's still using sort of these nonlinear activations. And it does these weight updates through backpropagation and through gradient descent. So it has kind of all of the things that we think of um, as a sort of modern day neural network. And in particular, MNIST is like this pretty small data set. It's just 28 by 28. So the actual you know, 
network isn't super complex, and you can kind of just draw it on the screen pretty easily, but it looks like basically we have uh, this first convolutional layer. So we're going from the input, which is just a single channel. It's 32 by 32. The first convolutional layer has six filters. So the output is basically this six channel image, and it's not doing any padding. So the output is 28 by 28, and it has sort of these six channels. And then I think it does uh, some sort of subsampling or max pooling. And next we have a convolutional layer that goes from these 14 by 14 images, and it has uh, 16 channels in the output. So we basically have these filters that are, uh, so we have 16 different filters, and each of them is going to be, I think, three by three by six. If you think about sort of what the size of the filters are, they might also be five by five filters, I'm not totally sure. Um, they might, uh, yeah, I think they're probably five by five filters to make this uh, amount that it changes work out right. So if you apply a five by five filter without padding to a 14 by 14 image, you're gonna get a 10 by 10 output image. Uh, and like we talked about, each of these filters are gonna have the same number of channels as the input image. So the filters are gonna be five by five by six channels. And you know, you're sort of running each of the channels independently on each of the channels of the input uh, and sort of spatially on an individual channel and then summing all of the output together. So we have 16 filters in this second convolutional layer that occurs after the subsampling. We have, um, I think, another subsampling layer. So we just have these sort of two convolutional layers, two max pooling layers, and then some of these fully connected layers that give us our final output. I looked for a while to figure out what this Gaussian connections thing was. I think he's probably talking about max pooling, but he might be talking about just using a logistic activation at the end. Um, I still am not sure. You guys can read it yourself in this paper if you're interested. Uh, but this is sort of what people think about as uh, really influential in terms of showing what can be done with neural networks uh, and, and how we can actually basically train this feature extractor. So now we're training basically these two convolutional, we're training the weights of these two convolutional layers to do some feature extraction. And then we have these fully connected layers at the end that basically take the image features that we find and produce these final outputs. Uh, so this was really influential in basically showing that this idea actually worked in practice. Uh, but it's this tiny little network, and it's running on what basically is like a toy data set. We're using you know, these tiny 32 by 32 grayscale images. And what people actually care about is like running computer vision models on really big data sets. So the next big development to sort of come along, I mean, this was, this was in 1998, I think. Uh, and everyone was basically like, oh, this is cool, you can do some handwriting recognition. But no one started using these networks for anything larger than just like these toy data sets uh, because they were very slow. So even, uh, and, and you guys have hopefully been seeing this with your neural networks, uh, even pretty simple neural networks can be pretty slow. And as you start trying to train them on larger and larger things, if you can imagine like sort of running these on your CPU on like big natural images, it would take a long time. And you've probably seen this even just with running convolutions on large images. It can take a couple seconds to run like a single convolution on a large image. Now imagine that you know, we have these convolutional layers where we're gonna be running a bunch of convolutions on an image and then running a bunch of convolutions on that output and then running a bunch of convolutions on that output, et cetera. Uh, it takes a really long time to just sort of make one pass through this network. And then you imagine we wanna do this stochastic gradient descent where we're doing this over and over again. Uh, these networks are pretty computationally intensive and take a lot of computational power to train. So the next big development uh, that people sort of recognize in computer vision is really kind of pushing things forward is the development of this really big data set. Uh, it's this data set called ImageNet, and it was developed by some researchers at Princeton who basically looked around and said, you know, there's no like natural image, really large data set out there, so we can really like test these computer vision models that we're playing around with. So in the past, you know, people would basically come up with some new idea and then they would also come up with like a data set to try it out on. So for, for Jan LeCun and for this LeNet, uh, 
you know, he came up with this network, but he also came up with MNIST. So he worked with some researchers to develop the data set that he is basically trying out this model on. And you can imagine that this is like a little bit weird, right? You're controlling basically the model that you're using, but also the test data that you're running it on. It would be like if I you know, let you guys write your final exam for this class or something, you would all hopefully do really well on it because you're controlling sort of both sides of the equation. So these researchers at Princeton got together and they were like, let's just make a really big data set and then people can you know, train models on it and sort of throw whatever they want at it and it'll be kind of this you know, neutral arbiter uh, and it will also uh, just be closer to what people actually care about when they think about computer vision. So, you know, it is a, it, it's an important task whether or not you can recognize handwriting, but, you know, in the example we just saw, it was super constrained, right? All of the digits were sort of perfectly centered in the little box. Uh, it's, you know, this black or white image. All of the images are very clean and stuff. And so these researchers thought, you know, let's gather basically a real world data set. Let's just get a bunch of images and have humans go through and label all of the images and, you know, if we can get a computer vision model that can predict correctly sort of these labels from these images, then we actually know we're doing some, some pretty challenging or real task. So the whole data set is 14 million images and 22,000 categories. And there's this really long tail where a lot of these categories have not a whole lot of labeled data. Uh, but there are a lot of categories that have a lot of data. So I think if you threshold at like, how many categories have like 700 or more images, you still have about 10,000 different categories. So it is a really big data set. Uh, you know, you have 10,000 categories that all have 700 examples each. That's like pretty decent in terms of training machine learning models on them. The most used version of ImageNet is this challenge subset that has 1.2 million images and 1,000 categories. And this was put together where basically every year you would have people submit to this server and the server would evaluate how well all of the models did and it was sort of this smaller subset that has a lot of nice properties. So in particular, these 22,000 categories have a lot of overlap. So for example, there are categories in there for like person, but there's also categories in there for like superhero and like fisherman and stuff like that. And the model is somehow supposed to tell that, you know, like someone dressed up as a fisherman is not also a person or someone dressed up as a superhero is not a person. So there's the, all these weird kind of uh, this noise that happens in ImageNet. But basically they put together this challenge subset where they knew that that wasn't going to happen. So each of these 1,000 categories is sort of distinct from each other. There aren't any like subset superset relations. They also threw in uh, a bunch of dog categories. So 120 of these categories are just different breeds of dog. And this is to measure basically fine grain classification. So a lot of the categories are really visually distinct. It'll be like leaf and like, uh, you know, laptop or something. And for determining the difference between those two things, you could just look at like what the main color was in the picture or something. Uh, but researchers really wanted to make sure that things that, models that worked well on ImageNet weren't just doing sort of this obvious stuff, but actually worked well on these really fine-grained categories where there weren't a lot of visual distinctions, and you really had to sort of look for these subtle visual cues. So they threw in 120 different breeds of dog, uh, and so when you, when you visualize, there's sort of these weird things that happen when you start visualizing these models that are trained on ImageNet, or you actually like start running these models in practice, uh, it's, it's like okay at sort of telling the difference between kind of general scenes and stuff, but it's really good at telling the difference between different kinds of dogs, uh, which is funny. But in terms of how this data set was constructed, basically Princeton before this had a big database called WordNet, which was basically all of the words in the English language and how they relate to each other. So it has basically subset superset relations, uh, like a surgeon is a type of doctor, and a doctor is a type of medical professional, and a medical professional is a type of person or something. Uh, so they have sort of this large tree or network type structure. Uh, and they also have basically relationships between words that mean the same thing. So they group words together into sin sets, so that if you have a bunch of words that are all related, they're all basically in the same group. 
And then they did a bunch of Google search in for all of these different terms. They basically picked out all of the nouns in WordNet and then did a bunch of Google searches for those terms and scraped a bunch of images. And then they paid workers on Mechanical Turk to go through and label these images with what the correct WordNet ID is. So you can imagine that basically if you searched on Google for like crow, you would get a bunch of pictures of crows, but you'd also get a bunch of pictures of other stuff too. And the Mechanical Turkers were basically paid to go through and just verify that like the images that you sort of think are associated with a particular label are actually associated with that label. Uh, a, a big one is sort of getting the fine grain stuff right too. So if you like do some search for like crows or some search for like huskies, you're gonna get a bunch of images of like ravens mixed in there too or a bunch of images of malamutes mixed in there too because these are subsets that people often confuse with each other and look sort of visually similar. So the Turkers were responsible for also kind of figuring out these fine grain classifications and hopefully putting stuff into the right bin. And people have done some studies on how accurate they were. And in, uh, I, so this was, again, with this bird data set that I'm kind of interested in. Uh, they basically looked at the label noise in ImageNet and it was pretty small. Out of like 700 images, they said like five to 10 of them would have sort of the wrong label, but most of them would be pretty correct. Uh, and in practice, these models can usually deal with a little bit of label noise, so they end up being pretty good at doing this fine grain classification as well as this uh, sort of broad classification between pretty visually distinct objects. So for a long time on ImageNet, you know, these are, these are images where the average dimension is like 500 by 300 or something. And you can imagine like running a convolutional network. There are a million of these images. So running a convolutional network on a million images is gonna take a really long time, much less training one of these things. So people use sort of the standard things that uh, we've already talked about where basically you extract SIFT vectors and you extract hog feature vectors and you extract these Fisher vector things that we talked about a little bit and you train some linear classifier on them. And that was kind of the state of the art on ImageNet for a long time. And then in, at uh, Neural Information Processing Systems, this conference in 2012, uh, this guy Alex Krzyzewski came along and was basically like, I did it. I trained this really big convolutional network on ImageNet and it works really well. Uh, so he didn't call it this, but everyone nowadays calls this AlexNet. Uh, and it is sort of the first neural network that someone actually trained on like real images uh, and it works really well. The original one is sort of complicated because he has this weird split where he basically had two GPUs. So he did uh, half of the processing on one GPU and half of the processing on another GPU. And like his, I guess his whole PhD was like figuring out exactly how big he could make this network so it fit onto these two uh, particular GPUs and like how, how efficient he could make it so he could crank through a bunch of images and stuff. But we're not gonna talk about this one, we're gonna talk about a simplified version of AlexNet which has a, basically the same performance um, and works very similarly. So uh, we have the same components that we had before where basically we have convolutional layers and max pooling layers uh, and some fully connected layers at the end. So we start off and he basically shrinks all of the images to be 227 by 227. Uh, because again, you know, even with making things really efficient, uh, it's still hard to do these convolutions on really big images. So uh, we just sort of shrink them down to this smaller size. Early on, he uses these 11 by 11 convolutions to extract uh, really basic features. And so a quick quiz in the first convolutional layer, how many convolutional filters are there? Oops, said it. 96, how do you know that? Exactly, because this output from the first convolutional layer has 96 channels. So there are 96 convolutional filters in the first layer. The first layer does basically a convolution with a stride of four. So he's using 11 by 11 filters. Uh, so there's a lot of spatial information that gets captured in the filter itself. So he can use a pretty big stride for that filter and basically not apply it that often in the image. You can imagine that if you were using a filter that was like size two by two or three by three, 
if you did a stride of four, you would start missing some of the pixels, so you probably wouldn't want to use such a large stride. Uh, but if you use like a really large uh, filter for your first layer, then you can maybe get away with using larger strides. So the first layer is this convolution with 11 by 11 filters and this max pooling uh, that comes right afterwards. So he does a convolution of stride four and a max pooling of stride two, which ends up downsampling the image by a factor of eight. And we get this sort of first feature map that has 96 channels in it and it's 27 by 27. The next layer uses these five by five filters. Uh, again, sort of we have these larger filters that people don't tend to use nowadays, but uh, back then, they probably didn't know as much what they were doing. Uh, but the output of the second convolutional layer, uh, there are 256 five by five filters. And again, you see that this is representing basically one filter. So a single filter will have dimensions five by five by 96. So the convolutional filter, again, is looking at all of the channels in the input to produce the output. And there are 256 of those filters. So, and again, this max pooling layer with stride of two. So we end up with a 13 by 13 feature map. Uh, and then we have sort of a series of three by three convolutional layers and one final max pooling layer to get us down to six by six by 256. And then what follows is a bunch of fully connected layers where we go from this six by six by 256, which I can't remember what that is, but it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of features with a fully connected layer where the output is 4096, and then another fully connected layer where the output is 4096. So this is sort of the same kind of neural network that you guys are implementing uh, in your homework where we have these big fully connected layers, all of the input is connected to all the output. And then finally we have uh, a fully connected layer where the output is a thousand dimensional vector, and you run a softmax on top of that uh, thousand dimensional vector and get your final predictions. So this was the entry for the ImageNet challenge uh, in 2012, and it was way higher than these traditional methods, like using these linear SVMs on top of these SIFT features. Uh, and the ImageNet challenge had already been going on for a couple years, uh, and people had sort of been restricted to using these older methods. So it took a long time for someone to kind of come along and actually uh, implement these convolutional networks on these real images. And the big reason uh, for why this worked was GPU processing and pushing all of this computation to the GPU. So Alex basically spent a really long time implementing all of the components of this network on a GPU. And uh, his software, q to convnet and q to convnet 2 are sort of the first modern neural network frameworks where you can specify the architecture of a neural network and feed in some input images and it pushes all the computation to the GPU and does this processing there. Uh, and, and the reason GPUs make sense for this is GPUs are massively parallel but can't do sort of the same operations that CPUs can do. Uh, but that's okay because again, these convolutional layers were just doing weighted sums. And in particular, all of the processing that we're doing is sort of independent from each other. So if you imagine basically subsequent applications of these convolutional filters, they don't really depend on the applications of the other filters or previous applications, et cetera. So this is just a really big parallel processing uh, task. And so it doesn't matter that GPUs don't have basically the same range of operations because all we're doing is multiplications and adding. Uh, and the GPUs can do this massively parallel so we can get you know, factors of a fa or 100 or more speed up compared to doing this on CPU. And even with sort of these uh, GPUs and this large speed up, training still took a really long time just for this pretty simple network uh, running it through ImageNet. Uh, but, you know, like when he basically gave this talk at NIPS, there were a bunch of people there and uh, everyone was super excited about it because he sort of posted these numbers on the ImageNet challenge and people didn't really know how he had gotten such good numbers on it. Uh, and this sort of idea of running convolutional networks and being able to train them on GPUs basically was the start of everything that we think of today as modern computer vision or uh, sort of all of the advances in computer vision research. And one byproduct of this is that NVIDIA's stock price has just gone through the roof because 
Uh, all of the big companies nowadays, like Amazon and Google and whoever, are buying tons of GPUs so that they can do their own computer vision research and so that they can uh, sell time on computers to people like me who want to use lots of GPUs to do my own research. So what exactly, question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> a lot of things affect stock price. I think people have also thought that GPU stock is somehow tied to cryptocurrency, which never made a ton of sense to me because like, you can't really mine Bitcoin on GPUs anymore. Um, I guess you can do like Ethereum or something, but uh, it's still not very efficient. I think most of the increase was due to neural network stuff. For the time being, like NVIDIA is the only kind of GPU that you can really train neural networks on. Uh, and this is mostly due to a really good library that supports neural network training. So they have uh, what's called QDNN, which is a bunch of functions that they supply so that you can like plug into GPUs and have it do really efficient convolutions and max pooling and uh, fully connected layers and stuff. Really efficient, like sort of neural network primitives. So instead of actually like having to program it all yourself in CUDA, you can just use their library to do sort of the base operations yourself. Uh, and they're also just like the fastest. So even if you sort of use like an AMD GPU and you try to do all this stuff in OpenCL or something, uh, it's really hard to match the numbers that they get from their libraries. They have really efficient implementations, even of just like matrix operations and stuff. Um, so for now, I think their dominance in the market is pretty secure, but if you know, someone at OpenCL spent a ton of time and hacked together like a really efficient library, maybe AMD would make a comeback or something. Cool, so what exactly uh, are these neural networks actually learning? We just sort of have this black box where we're like feeding in an image over here and we're getting some output predictions and like you can train it with gradient descent and it ends up working pretty well, but like what's actually going on inside of it? It turns out they're actually like learning to do feature extraction. So remember that the first layer of AlexNet are these 11 by 11 convolutions. And remember that you know, a convolution has the same number of channels as the input. So these are just basically RGB images and we can just look at them directly. So when we actually like look at what the convolutional filters are that we're applying in the first layer, we see things that make a lot of sense. Uh, at the top, we basically have a lot of oriented edges. And remember that he had this sort of split between these two networks that he was kind of running simultaneously through these GPUs. So it looks like basically the top part does a lot of like black and white processing. It does a lot of looking for edges uh, and looking for things like that regardless of kind of color information. And then the bottom part of this network or sort of the other filters in this network are doing a lot of color processing. So they're looking for places where the color is changing between two parts of an image, so sort of edges or gradients in color space. Question. Yeah, so these are looking for uh, areas of uh, sort of texture. So you can imagine that places where filters like this would activate really strongly are, uh, you know, like the general rule is basically that filters will activate uh, along places that look like those filters themselves. So these would activate on sort of noisy parts of an image. You can imagine like a like stone gravel sort of uh, beach or something like that, or maybe like pavement where you can see kind of raised uh, things. So anywhere with sort of a lot of texture, a lot of fast change in an image, you would get pretty high activations. Uh-oh, I did this. You'd get pretty high activations for uh, filters that looked like that. But this is kind of cool. So we can like actually see what's going on uh, when we're doing this neural network. So this is what the first layer looks like. You know, what do the other layers look like? Well, the other layers are a lot harder to visualize. Usually we have sort of these three by three filters and we've lost the ability to sort of easily just like display them because the channels that these filters have are relative to the output of the previous layer. So it's not like we're looking at RGB pixels anymore. We're looking at the output of all of these edge detectors. And we're basically forming linear combinations both in space and in channel dimension of these edge detectors. And if you just kind of display these things naively, you can't really tell what's going on because you know maybe this first row is 
operating on edges in the horizontal direction, and maybe the second row is operating on edges in the vertical direction, but like, you know, you, you can look at this, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense to you. Uh, so people have come up with a bunch of other ways for trying to visualize what's actually happening in these intermediate layers. So one way to do it is basically try to figure out what information makes its way through the network after every stage and what information is sort of lost. Um, this image is really hard to see. You guys could go back to the slides afterward, I guess. Uh, but it looks like sort of what we hope to happen kind of happens in that when we're doing this classification task, it, the network manages to just get information at the end from the sort of relevant patch in the image. So I've sort of boosted the contrast of the last row uh, by a lot in this extra image. And we see that like the little red panda, uh, his face shows up really prominently, but all of the rest of the image is sort of ignored. And for these, uh, I think they're little foxes or something, we see that it kind of is looking at these foxes, but ignoring like the grass in the background and stuff. Uh, it's paying a lot of attention to the little wolf. It's paying a lot of attention to this guy's hand and the ax or hammer or whatever that is, but kind of ignoring like the trees and stuff in the background. And it's really locking on to like the eyes and nose of this mouth, mouse, uh, but ignoring like the mouse trap and the house and stuff in the background. So we can kind of see like basically at subsequent layers, like after the first layer, uh, it's still kind of looking at a lot of different parts of the image. And as the image makes its way through each layer, it's starting to sort of ignore more and more irrelevant stuff and focus in on what the actual like salient object is or what the thing is that it's trying to predict. Uh, but you can't either, you can't get a lot of information sort of from this method of visualization either about like what each individual layer is actually doing. So one interesting idea is, you know, we can feed images into this network and we can see what the activations of different layers or different neurons is. So let's feed in images and uh, find images that maximally sort of activate certain neurons or certain layers. And by doing this, we start actually seeing that these neurons are kind of learning things that are interesting. So in particular, this is a neuron that seems to activate really strongly for sort of white flowers uh, or things that I guess can kind of be mistaken for white flowers, like this little fluffy puppy at the end. Uh, and we have this one that's sort of activating for these purple flowers. And in particular, they all seem kind of like spikier and maybe these flowers are like maybe softer or rounder or something, although we have kind of that one that appears in both of them. Uh, or actually, I don't think it even appears in this one. It's just very similar to ones that appear in this. This one I find really cool. So this one seems to be looking for round objects that are green or yellow. Uh, so it's not sort of taking into account much semantics yet because it has sort of this round panel on this little machine. And it also has like this little ball that this kid is sitting on. Uh, but all of sort of these image patches contain some kind of round, yellow or green-ish objects in them. Um, and then presumably later on, uh, you know, some of those objects will start getting sort of subclassified by later layers or neurons in the network. So we start to see that basically subsequent layers of the network are starting to pick out uh, different parts of the object and starting to respond kind of differently to different inputs and stuff. So that's good, uh, but still this is kind of limited to basically images that we can feed into the network. So another idea is instead of finding interesting images, we can actually make these interesting images ourselves. So in the past we basically used stochastic gradient descent to optimize our network, and we've used it to basically change our, the weights in our network. But instead of doing that, we can actually backpropagate our gradient basically all the way to the image itself. So remember that basically when we're doing backprop, we're figuring out the partial derivative with respect to the weights and the partial derivative with respect to the previous input or sort of the output from the last layer. And we can do this backpropagation all the way until we get to the actual image itself. And then all of a sudden we have methods of changing the image to make it do certain things. So you can think about uh, backpropagating error through the network and saying, you know, how can I make this image look more like a dog or more like a cat? Uh, 
But you can also imagine instead of your loss being related to making the correct prediction, you can basically artificially construct losses that say, I want to activate this particular neuron really strongly. Can you, can you actually construct an image to activate this particular neuron? Or construct images that activate this layer really strongly uh, and don't necessarily do anything else. And so you're fixing the weights of the network and you're optimizing the image to do certain things using the same process, using gradient descent that we already talked about. And by doing this, we actually start to get a lot of information about what's going on in these individual layers. Uh, and you guys have probably seen this as like deep dream type stuff. Uh, so this was popular for like doing cool uh, sort of modifications to images and stuff uh, a couple years ago. But it's actually also really process or, uh, it's also really useful for understanding what's going on in these different layers of an image. And so when we run these algorithms and we try to basically optimize for early on layers in the network, we see that sort of the first layers of the network respond really strongly to basically areas of really large contrast. And there's not really any sort of semantic meaning that's happening here. Uh, it's just a bunch of like these sort of large colored blobs uh, and sort of black and white and stuff. And this makes sense if you think about sort of the original filters that we saw. They were looking mostly for oriented edges, uh, different like places in the image where the color changes or where there are really strong lines. So an image like this is likely to basically be really exciting to all of those filters that we saw before. But now we can actually start doing this visualization for other layers in the network. So when we look at basically intermediate layers in the network, it seems like it's starting to combine together these sort of simple features into more complex concepts. Uh, so it's responding strongly to things like uh, lines and curves, uh, and it sort of starts responding to some of these things that kind of look like shapes. Uh, so it's basically combining together sort of the edges that were detected previously, and now it's looking for more interesting uh, things going on in the image. Still, there's not a lot of semantics. The one thing that you do start to see is areas that sort of look like eyes. It starts especially looking for a lot of things that uh, kind of look like circles and stuff. And this is pretty easy. Basically, you combine together a bunch of edges that all are going in different directions, and you can look for sort of these circles and uh, simple shapes like that. And eyes are, I guess, maybe very useful for uh, determining what kind of dog you're looking at or something. Uh, but the network seems really obsessed with looking for eyes and images. And then as we get to later layers, we see that it's basically starting to combine together uh, these objects into more complex things. So now we're looking for basically eyes, but also you know maybe like two eyes and a nose or something. Again, we see a lot of like dog artifacts as we start doing this visualization because all of these networks are trained on this data set where there's a ton of dog pictures. Um, and we see as we keep going later, you know, it starts combining these into more semantically meaningful things. So we have a couple eyes and a nose and maybe a little mouth on top of like a body and we start to get weird little things that look like dogs and stuff. I'll send out a link. The link to this YouTube video is in, uh, in that little citation on the, uh, on the slide, but it's pretty interesting to see. So that YouTube video actually just goes through this whole progression of each individual layer uh, what's kind of happening at that layer. Um, but basically, we see that later on in the network, we actually, the things that sort of excite or activate the neurons later on are these actual sort of semantically meaningful things, uh, these complex objects and shapes and stuff. And so this is cool because this is actually what we wanted, and it seems like basically these neural networks are actually working. So early on, basically, we have this low-level feature extractor. And then as we move through the network, we're kind of building on top of that and adding more and more semantically meaningful features that we're extracting. So at these mid-level convolutional layers, we're basically combining together these edges, and we're looking for responses that are a combination of edges that might correspond to curves or different shapes. And as we're moving along from there, we start looking for combinations of shapes and edges that correspond to actual uh, semantically meaningful concepts like objects or scenes, depending on what you're training your uh, network on. And then finally, we have, again, this sort of linear predictor at the end where we're taking these features and actually predicting, you know, is this 
this kind of dog or this other kind of dog or this bird or whatever. So this is cool. Uh, you know, neural networks seem to be actually doing basically what we actually want them in some sense to do, and it's way more powerful than the features we had before. Before we were basically extracting like gradients uh, or maybe some simple color information, and now our feature extractors are actually like looking for you know faces or little dog noses or stuff like that. We have a question. Uh, it did back then. Yeah, so one of the cool things about GPUs is that at least like in the past few years, they've still been doing the Moore's Law thing where every year and a half, NVIDIA will release a new one that is about twice as fast as the old one. So since AlexNet, we've gone up like eight or 16 times in terms of how fast these things are, uh, which is very significant. So now you can train AlexNet on one GPU in I think like eight hours or something, in like a day or something. Uh, but people have obviously started doing more and more complex networks that still take you know, about a week or more to train. Yeah. Absolutely, it's super tedious. <laughs> you think about for a while what you think might work and you write something down and you start training and you come back a week later and see what happened. Um, you can also, I mean, so I have a bunch of, the way that I kind of do this is I have a lot of machines and a lot of GPUs and I train separate ones on each of those things uh, and do sort of a rough like grid search or sort of random search over the space of possible network configurations. And from that, you know, you start to basically figure out what works and what doesn't work. Uh, at this point, I have a pretty good mental model for like how to build networks that work well and some of that is from my own experiments, and a lot of that is from reading papers where other people talk about what worked well for them. But it is like this really long process of just like trial and error, basically. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the networks that we have right now aren't very good, and there are probably much better ones out there, but we just don't really know what they are yet because it takes so long to, to do any of this trial and error stuff. But anyway, AlexNet is really good. Uh, you know, it seems like these convolutional networks work well. Let's just make them bigger. Uh, and it turns out that this also works really well. So VGG is sort of the next step in kind of this evolution of neural networks and how people use them and what people trained. Uh, so this was from Oxford, and it was considered really deep at the time. It's like 16 to 19 convolutional layers. Uh, and VGG 16 is still really commonly used as a feature extractor. I sort of don't think it should be because there are a lot of better alternatives now that are a lot faster and more efficient and will produce better results. But it's you know got a lot of name recognition out there, so everyone keeps using it. Uh, and we have sort of a very similar setup to what we were doing last time. Uh, but instead of doing kind of a bunch of different size convolutions, in AlexNet we had an 11 by 11 convolution, then a five by five convolution, and then a bunch of three by three convolutions. VGG16 only uses three by three convolutions. So there are a couple of three by three convolutions at the beginning that there are both 64 uh, filters for each of those convolutions. There are, is a max pooling layer and then a bunch of three by three convolutions where you have 128 filters at every layer and then a bunch where you have 256 filters at every layer, and then a bunch where you have 512 at every layer. Uh, and finally, we have sort of the same output that we had last time where we have these big, fully connected layers at the end and our final prediction, which is some softmax thing. And when you actually write it out like this, uh, I think, let's see, I can't remember what's different between these two. I think this one is the one, D is the one that people sort of think of as VGG16. Um, but they tried out a bunch of different versions of this on presumably a bunch of GPUs that they had sitting around to train this on. Uh, VGG16 is pretty slow, but it's also like very accurate when you start looking at the actual numbers. So uh, in particular, 
we have some error numbers over here in terms of top one and top five error, which is what people care about. We'll have sort of a summary slide at the end for what all of these networks get. Um, but AlexNet has like 61% top one accuracy and 70, uh, I don't want to say that, or 80% top five accuracy. So like 20% top five error. So we went from 20% top five error with AlexNet to you know, less than 10% top five error with VGG16. So now when you look at uh, top five error is just, if you look at the top five predictions that the network makes, were any of them correct? Uh, so that's like top five accuracy. So a lot of times you get situations basically where there are visual categories that are really similar to each other. And there is also basically some noise in ImageNet. Uh, so I think there is both corn cob and corn in ImageNet 1000 or something like, or there's ear. So there's ear, but uh, the ear that it's talking about in WordNet is basically an ear of corn. And there's also corn in ImageNet. So when researchers were putting together the data, they basically didn't realize that these two concepts were basically the exact same thing. They added them both in. Uh, and now there's some just kind of label noise basically in ImageNet. So the thing that most people care about is basically top five error. Out of the top five predictions that your network makes, are any of them basically the right category? Uh, and in top five error, we went from AlexNet, which is about 80%, to VGG16, which is about 90%. So that's a pretty significant jump. Um, but VGG16 is sort of inefficient. We're basically stringing together a bunch of these three by three convolutions. And we don't necessarily need to do that. So remember that each three by three convolution is looking at this three by three space spatially, but also looking at every single channel. Uh, and potentially some of that computation might be extraneous. So instead, uh, Lynn at all these people came up with this idea of this network and network thing where we can run three by three convolutions to process spatial information. Uh, and then use basically one by one convolutions to reduce the number of channels. So you can imagine that if you're running a three by three convolution on a 256 by 256 image, or uh, sorry, 32 by 32 by 256 channel image, uh, it's really expensive. But if instead of running a three by three convolution on this image, you run a one by one convolution, it's a lot more efficient. Uh, you have you know, one ninth of the number of operations to do. So one by one convolutions are really fast. And we can use that to basically reduce this number of channels. So you can kind of compress the feature space that you have from being in 256 dimensions to being 128 dimensions or even smaller than that potentially. And then we'll run our three by three convolution on this sort of compressed feature space. And this is a lot more efficient than running it on this original feature space that we had. And we can still run you know, 256 three by three filters or something on this compressed feature space. And we'll get some output that is sort of the same size that you would imagine as running a three by three filter on this original image and running 256 of them. But now we have, just by adding in these one by one convolutions that do this downsampling or this compression, we have a much more efficient uh, step to go from this feature map to this feature map. Good question. Uh, just, sorry. Yeah. Like, how do people choose the sizes of them? Yeah. Oh, no, that's the whole point. So people, I don't know what happened to my laptop. People aren't choosing them, right? Uh, this is a neural network, so you're training them all. Um, so all of these filters, going way back, all of these filters were basically learned by the model. So it starts out totally random, just like you know when you're training these neural network, it starts out totally random. And as you process more and more images, and as you do this gradient descent, these are the, these are the filters that were actually learned by the network. Uh, and that's why you know, they're not in any sort of sensible ordering. That's also why you see basically some filters that look very similar to each other and are you know, possibly redundant. So I think you know, like we have these two oriented edge filters where one of them looks like it's just sort of the opposite of the other one. Uh, and maybe those are a little bit extraneous. You have a lot of filters that end up looking for uh, sort of edges in one direction or another. Uh, let's see if I find another one. Uh, you have the same sort of thing here where you have 
a, you're looking for blue on top of yellow or yellow on top of blue, um, potentially you could represent that more simply if you were hand designing these features. Um, but I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of features that look like this where you're sort of looking for vertical patches in an image uh, or sort of vertical lines in an image. Question. Yeah, so you can even sort of look in here and see like this, these two filters in this bottom left hand corner, they're like not doing very much. Uh, there are, you know, a bunch of other ones like who knows what that filter is doing. It's like very dim compared to the rest of the filters. So you can actually even just kind of visualize and see like if you have a lot of redundancies going on. People have tried to come up with automated ways of doing this, of like inspecting intermediate layers and seeing if there are, if there are filters that aren't doing anything and if there are like just getting rid of them. But in general, there's no easy way to kind of know a priori like how many filters you'll need at a particular layer. Um, it's one of those sort of open problems where the more filters you give the network, the more powerful it'll be. So it'll get better, at least in terms of training error. Uh, you, you might be sort of overfitting to your data at that point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely an open problem, like how many filters is the right number of filters per layer and stuff like that. So uh, Lynn et al. sort of introduced this new idea of basically using uh, three by three and one by one convolutions kind of sequentially and doing sort of spatial processing of information using three by three convolutions and then processing basically differences in channels or basically processing information between channels using these one by one convolutions. And then we get to Google Net where these networks just start getting really strange. Uh, and basically all, all of these networks are trying to make the operations more efficient but sort of equivalently powerful so that you can make them even larger and uh, they still can run in sort of some sensible time. So another way to improve efficiency is basically you can imagine like running a three by three or a five by five convolution operation on some image and not all of those three by three or five by five convolutions will be doing the same thing. And in particular, some of them might not need to be that powerful. So some of the three by three convolutions maybe are not actually using spatial information at all. Maybe what you wanna do uh, at some particular layer is just combine together the responses of different filters in the previous layer. And the responses of different filters will just sort of be differences between channels and not actually differences that occur sort of spatially. So you can imagine that if you wanna look for like an X in an image, you just wanna look for an oriented edge in one direction and an oriented edge in another direction. And that would just be a response of two different uh, edge detectors in the previous image. And you wouldn't actually need to sort of process spatial information. So we can start basically splitting up uh, these layers into a bunch of different operations and then uh, operations where you might need a lot of spatial information will happen in some parts of the network and operations where you are just combining together sort of uh, outputs of filters where you don't need spatial information will happen in a different part. So we get what's called basically this inception module where we have the previous layers output and we're going to split it to go down a bunch of different routes. And one of the routes is just this one by one convolution, one is this three by three convolution, one is this five by five convolution, and one is this max pooling layer. And so this is saying basically, take this three by three convolution, and instead of doing just this big three by three convolution, uh, let's do a bunch of different operations on it. And this way, if you wanna look for uh, some kind of information where you need a lot of spatial sort of dimension to what you're looking for, that feature will basically be detected in these five by five convolutions that are happening. Whereas if you, all you're looking for is basically differences in feature outputs from the previous layer, that will all happen in the one by one convolution. And basically probably some stuff will happen in three by three as well. Maybe you don't even need to really do that much processing. Uh, maybe there are some useful features that get extracted just by doing a max pooling operation. So they threw that in as well. And 
They also use this idea that we just talked about of using one by one convolutions to compress the feature space before doing this processing as well. So the inception module, when you add in sort of this dimensionality reduction, basically looks like this, where we have the output from the previous layer. And again, we're splitting up that output to be processed along multiple different routes. And so you can imagine that basically, say, we're, say we have a three by three convolution uh, that has 256 different filters. Instead of using a three by three convolution that has 256 filters, we can use an inception module instead. And it will have maybe uh, 128 different one by one convolutions and maybe 64 three by three convolutions and 64 five by five convolutions. And so we still have a module that's doing some processing uh, spatially. It's also doing some processing between channels. But if you imagine basically taking 256 filters and representing them as 128 one by one filters, 64 three by three and 64 five by five filters, you actually get a much more efficient operation. And Google's sort of theory behind this was that we don't actually need the full power of all of those three by three convolutions. A lot of that can sort of be handled by just this stream that goes through the one by one convolutions. Uh, and so we start to basically make this more efficient. And as we make it more efficient, we basically can make it really big, uh, like really, really big. So this is the full sort of first version of Google Net where we have all of these different modules that are sort of doing this splitting up into different paths and recombining and splitting up and recombining. Um, and basically the idea is how can we make these met, uh, networks even bigger without making them too expensive? And one of the interesting things you sort of note when they work on training GoogleNet is we have multiple outputs from this network. And this was one of the things that they uh, did to uh, start avoiding some of the problems when you have these really deep neural networks. So actually, the network here is going to predict basically the output label for every image. And it's also going to predict the output label here. And it's also going to predict the output label here. And the reason that we start doing that is basically this problem that someone alluded to earlier of gradient vanishing or gradient explosions. And basically, as we start getting really deep neural networks, the gradients that we have at our output are flowing backward through a bunch of different input uh, on, as we sort of do this back propagation of loss. So we have different situations where these gradients can either get really small and sort of vanish away because we're multiplying them by all of these weights, or we can have situations where these gradients get really large and start to explode. Uh, and in general, we often see sort of vanishing gradients, especially if you have pretty good weight initialization. Uh, and what you need is sort of in these really deep networks, you may have a situation where you have some gradient that goes into the network here, but as it goes backward and backward through all of these layers, you will get to a point back here where all of your gradient information or sort of all of the meaning has kind of vanished. And these layers will just never get any meaningful gradient and never really get updated in a way that actually affects the model output. And because of that, you'll never really make any progress because these are sort of the most important layers in the network, right? These are the things that are doing sort of the basic like line and edge extraction and stuff. So if we add in some extra layers here, we'll actually get gradient information that, you know, it doesn't have to go as far through the network. It can just back propagate a little bit. And as long as our gradient doesn't vanish too quickly, we'll hopefully get some gradient information here uh, and be able to actually update these weights and avoid some of that problem. Question. Uh, I think this was like, I think they did it for, I mean, so it's Google, so they have a bunch of GPUs. Uh, and the comparison isn't even really fair at that point. But I think if like I tried to train it on a GPU right now, it would take a few days. So it was like two or three or four times more complex than training AlexNet, I think. Uh, on CPU or on GPU? <laughs> so on GPU, it's basically instant. Uh, a network like this can run at you know, more than 100 frames a second, probably. It depends on sort of what your input size is. And on CPU, it'd probably take a second or two seconds or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So each of these outputs is going to have some sort of loss associated with it. 
and have some gradient information that gets back propagated. So there will be gradient that comes from here, and there's also gradient that comes from here. And when you get to the place where those two paths kind of meet, you just add together that gradient and then keep back propagating it. Uh, yeah. We have more questions. Question. We'll talk about that later. Don't get too far ahead. So, you know, you're feeding an input here, and we're trying to predict something over here. And basically, they've just added in an extra prediction path. So they've added in an extra little path where you take out some image features here, and you try to predict what the class is. And you also take out some image features from this layer and try to predict what the class of the image is. And you're basically, each of these predictions should, in theory, try to like, be predicting the same class, because the image is the same. Uh, what this is basically adding on is some extra gradient that says that you know, these features should be good for you know, doing some extra processing and doing the eventual prediction. But even these features by themselves are probably pretty good at getting some level of accuracy in terms of prediction. And so you add on basically this extra little classifier in the middle of the network to help along the network uh, in terms of training so you don't run into this vanishing gradient problem. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So at the end, you would take these outputs and just ignore them. And the only thing that you actually care about is sort of the output at the last layer of the model. Uh, you sort of, you, and you even, I think you sort of reduce the amount that these gradients matter as you get further and further along in training. But they're really important early on in training for getting useful gradient information back through your network. Question. Yeah. 